questions, please use this microphone. There is one in each row. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Thanks. So in my uh, lecture, uh, feel free to stop anytime. This, uh, I, uh, I mean, uh, don't worry about continuity. For, this is fine for the pedagogical lectures to stop at any point. Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, so uh, welcome again. Uh, so what we, uh, uh, so my talk is going to about laser cooling. Uh, so I want to start with a very broad thing, what we, uh, sort of what people do in this field. Um, uh, I know many of your uh, PhD students, you already know all these things, but there are also a huge number of participants who are actually uh, master students. So I want to tell you what, uh, what is really laser cooling, and then slowly we'll go, go into the uh, details and try to take up each point and see how far we can go. So um, see for any laser cooling experiment, you actually, uh, so you want to have atoms cold, but what you actually start with is probably a very hot oven, which you heat up to several, uh, uh, several hundred of degrees. So let's say 200 degrees centigrade. So it gives you, so there is a metal, it gives you some kind of a beam. It doesn't have to be an oven of this kind. It doesn't have to be a beam, but you need a source, which is very hot. And which gives you a, a vapor. So suppose, so typically people will work with alkali atoms. We'll tell you why we work with alkali atoms. Um, and then you want to, so these, these are these atoms which are moving and you want to slow them down and you want to slow them down with light. So what you do is you shine a laser from the opposite direction. And uh, this has some frequency and this has some momentum, H bar K. K is a wave number, omega is the angular frequency of the laser. Um, uh, the idea is that each time we want these uh, atoms to absorb this radiation, so it's this radiation, this light has to be near resonance with the atomic transition. So if you have hydrogen, suppose uh, it has to be resonant with some transition in hydrogen. So, uh, so you know the hydrogen uh, energy levels and it uh, absorbs. So suppose there is a ground state of the system. Let's call it one and there is another excited state, some excited state. Uh, uh, the atom is initially here, it absorbs. The moment it absorbs this photon momentum h bar k that is imparted into the, to the uh, atom and therefore the atom which was let's say moving with a, 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 a momentum mv after absorption of the photon it will move with a slightly smaller momentum which is uh, mv minus h bar k right for after one absorption but that's h bar k is a very small number photon momentum so what you want is actually you want this absorption to happen many times. And therefore, you suppose it ha happens many times, then you actually can increase uh, this. Uh, and suppose there are n number of absorptions, so, that, so it will be n h bar k. And if this is sufficiently large, you can actually cool to very low temperature. So by cooling, we basically mean taking away the kinetic energy or the momentum of the system or reduce the velocity, reduce the speed. So uh, what happens? So, but remember, if when it absorbs, it goes to the excited state too, but it does not stay there. So it will decay. So when it decays, it also gives out a photon. So it also gives you another momentum kick H bar K. The only difference with respect to the absorption 
is that when it when it emits, it can be in any direction, right? So this h bar k can be the kick can be in any direction. So if you let it happen many many times, the average momentum kick from this is zero. So absorption gives you a directional momentum kick. Spontaneous emission from this after it has when it is decaying does not give you on an average any momentum kick. That is why it works. We want uh, you want this. So now, uh, how do you make it possible? So here's the thing. You know that I can tune. Uh, I can tune a laser, or a, you know our sound waves. You know that there is Doppler effect. So I, if I am something moving, it will see uh, uh, see a frequency which is slightly different from uh, when it is at rest, right? So and this uh, uh, frequency will depend on the speed of the atom. So suppose I have a radiation which is tuned to the atomic resonance. Right, at, when the atom is at rest, it can absorb that radiation. But if it's moving, would people uh, online people move your mind? Great. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, where was I? Uh, uh, yeah. So when it is in rest, it will absorb the radiation. But if it is moving, it sees a different frequency. It doesn't absorb. So if the velocity keeps changing, actually, if you slow down this thing after one momentum, it has changed its velocity, right? So after a few moment, it will change by enough that it will not absorb the radiation. So what do you do? So a lot of work goes into do, doing something so that it always stays in radiation, uh, in, 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 in resonance. And one of the effects, so this uh, effect that is used is uh, the Zeeman effect. So, uh, and this Zeeman effect basically, uh, what it does is, you know, this is uh, of the something like mu dot b, where mu is the uh, mu will oppose this electron spins, and it will depend on some constant times this electron spin dotted with the magnetic field. So this, what I've written here, is the energy uh, due to this uh, magnet minus uh, energy due to this magnetic field. Right. So now you can imagine that you can. Uh, so this system's energy, if you apply a time or a space dependent a magnetic field. Let's say it's in the uh, say, say it's in the uh, z direction. So then it's, it will be a b z kind of thing. So the energy level of the atom itself will depend now start depending on this where it is located. So remember, as the atom is moving, it is also ch changing its position, right? So if I can tune the energy level of the system such, such that here the energy levels is like this, here it is like this, here it is like this, here it is like this. I mean, so the two, let's say the ground state is not changing, only the excited state I'm plotting. So if the energy level is changing, and if I can, as it is changing, it is slowing down. So I can play with this uh, velocity and this space dependent magnetic field. And uh, if I have this right, then irrespective of where the atom is and what the velocity is, it will absorb the radiation and, um, uh, and slow down. So we'll look at this a little bit uh, in more in details, but uh, what, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have to look at Zeeman effect. We have to look at this, uh, which is a basically a two-level system. Uh, essentially, that is all uh, uh, we will end up uh, needing to understand. We'll have to look at uh, um, uh, 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 stimulated and uh, uh, and spontaneous emission, right? So these are the things which uh, uh, are required for me to get it to work. Um, what else do we need? We need that these atoms. Uh, when they're moving, we don't want any other things to collide and change its uh, interaction with this light, magnetic field, whatever. So we want very high vacuum. So we, so typically all experiments will have very high vacuum, uh, and uh, and uh, you will um, uh, so so there can be some differential. Uh, sort of here it might be very uh, low vacuum, but you can have a differential stages where you can reach high vacuum. But it is necessary that you have high vacuum. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, so. Uh, so once uh, it is cooled, you, uh, you can do further cooling. So I think we will not go into the details of how you go. So this is basically uh, what laser cooling does. But then this will uh, take you to very low temperatures, let's say tens of micro kelvins. But if you want to go colder, then uh, actually uh, you have to do something, let's say, uh, which is called a dipole trap, which is again a, 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 a light-induced phenomena. So you basically. Uh, and it can again be explained by two level system. And uh, basically you have a focused laser beam slightly different and trap these atoms and you do something like, uh, which is called evaporative cooling, which we will not. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the uh, thing is that at, at some point of time, uh, when the atom really goes to uh, rest, let's say, this, uh, it can still absorb this H bar K momentum, right? So that uh, ultimate limit for laser cooling is that H bar K. So that momentum kick that it provides, so at, at, uh, and that will change its increase its velocity, right? So that is the ultimate limit. So if you want to go lower than that, and that is called the recoil limit, the recoil from the single momentum, whatever you get, that is the limit you will actually do in laser cooling. So people want to go below that. Does it? Repeated spontaneous emission creates uh, heating, that is true. And, uh, and therefore, in laser cooling, actually, you do not just what I said right now, on an average, the momentum kick is zero. But if you look at the second moment, there is a, a random walk. So I'll talk about this in detail. So I want to lay the basic uh, uh, things for first and uh, tell you. Yeah, good, good question. Um, okay, so um, I think we'll now uh, start. Any other question? Yeah, so I think uh, we will. Uh, um, okay, what one more thing you need here, which is the first thing I forgot today, is that see this cycling, uh, this transition has to, uh, it has to always come back. So if you need this kind of a two level system, right? You, if you have uh, more levels, right? And the, if the while when it does spontaneous emission, it comes to another level, then this uh, atom in this uh, another level cannot absorb the same radiation. Therefore, you really need this two level system. And that uh, is, which is what I'm going to start by first lecture is this is called a, basically you need something which is a, uh, a cycling transition. So basically, uh, if you go from this state to this state, you only come back to this state. So you have to choose a system which has this property and alkali atoms are chosen because they have the, this property. So we'll start our uh, discussion. Uh, uh, what is this transition, right? So. Um, and so we'll start our discussion with uh, with how this energy level comes out about. So I think everybody is familiar with hydrogen atom. Right? So you know, if you have a hydrogen atom and you forget of the, about the spin of hydrogen atom, you know that the energy levels will be some uh, of the inner hydrogen level will be some hc and there's a readable constant divided by n square this is approximately what it goes as one one over n square what is n n is the principal uh, quantum number so this does not depend on no uh, no dependence on l on l right so the uh, so so uh, so and this is very special for a coulomb interaction it is this is only possible this is only because your interaction is e square over r. If you change your interaction, uh, uh, this will not be true. Um, so this is a very accidental case where you actually have a, a degeneracy between uh, 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 L degeneracy. And of course, if L it is degenerate in L, then all the ML le uh, energy levels also will have the same. So there is a lot of degeneracy in the system. Um, uh, so if you had, uh, but uh, okay, real hydrogen atom, you have to consider spin. So this is not how it looks like actually. So actually the uh, one S state is of course, doesn't have any, only has one, uh, only one S no P there. But uh, if you look at the two S state, then actually it will split. So this, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but if you include the uh, uh, spin of the electron and you have to consider relativistic effects, these are two always uh, sort of have similar magnitude. So this uh, lifts the region. So what you have to do is now you have to think about uh, uh, that this is this two p state, uh, which was degenerate, will not no longer be degenerate. And in addition, since the spin has an angular momentum, you you cannot only have this uh, s. You have to have an, have an additional angular momentum quantum number, which is the sum over. Uh, so you have to have some j, which is this l uh, plus the spin uh, angular orbital angular momentum plus the spin angular momentum. So we'll need to redefine a little bit of the uh, symbols. Okay, so uh, instead of doing it with hydrogen, let's start basically with alkali. So alkalis have the same kind of electronic structure as hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron, uh, alkalis have a field, field core, and there's only one val valence electron, right? So the next, so if you remember your periodic table, uh, uh, this was hydrogen, there was somewhere helium. Next one was lithium, which is in the same group. Then the next one was uh, sodium, uh, potassium, rubidium, cesium. All have uh, in the in the valence cell they have one electron. 
So it's somewhat similar to the hydrogen atom. The only difference is that this interaction between this valence electron and the nucleus is no longer exactly like this Coulomb interaction. So it's not exactly Coulomb, which breaks this NL degeneracy. So now you will not have a case where it is hydrogen-like. It will slightly, it, all these energy levels, S and P will be stable. So let's say, uh, so uh, let's, let's take this fellow, rubidium, just because this is like the favorite uh, candidate for most uh, experiments and a lot of work has gone into this, but any of them you can uh, look at in the same way. So this has, uh, uh, so the, uh, in this case, N is equal to five, the valence electron uh, in the five S state, right? So here it is one S, this is here it is two S, here it is three S, here it is four S, here is five S, next one is uh, 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 five S, right? So the electron in the ground state has five S. So, um, so of course, if N is equal to five, it can also have, I said that the L can be different. So it can, it also has uh, five P, and uh, five D and so on states. So it can have different states. It's not like hydrogen where there was in the ground state only a state, right? So you have different uh, S, P, uh, D states, and these have different energies because as I said, the degeneracy is broken. So if I draw the ground state of uh, rubidium, what I have is basically a five S state, and then I have a five P state. But then I told you that uh, the moment we do this, we have to include the electron spin. So uh, uh, the, uh, there is one electron. So I have uh, my spin is half. So let's say my um, I mean, I'm looking at the S state. So my L uh, uh, L uh, is zero. Uh, L equal to zero. I do an uh, angular momentum uh, addition. Uh, this thing here. So what are my values of J? That I have only one value of J, which is one by two. Right. So uh, if I look at a P state, then my electron in the P state still has half uh, spin half but my uh, orbital part now has angular momentum one. So I have two values of J actually, one plus, uh, uh, so one plus one by two, which is uh, three by two and uh, uh, one minus one by two, which is equal to one by two. Right? So the P state has now split into, has two uh, energy levels and they uh, has two states and they have different energies. So I have to basically have two P states and the notation is the following that uh, I have, to write this as a 5p state and what you put the value of j below this capital p and uh, sometimes you'll put the what is here is uh, uh, something which is 2s plus 1 so the uh, spectroscopic notation is the following so you whatever your state is ns or np or whatever it is so suppose you have a 2s state it will be 2s and then you have a capital s telling you what is l so this is l l equal to 0 if it is L equal to one, it will be P state. Here you have what is the J. So here right now I have P, P one by two, means it's the J equal to one by two. And here I have something which is two S plus one. So you have one electron. So S is one by two, one by two into two plus one is two. So this is the, my, this is, this is the notation. Sometimes people will drop various things. If it is not confusing, people might just like write, for example, P three by two or five P three by two. So it's of N equal to five L state, J equal to one by two. Uh, you can once you know J, you can sort of find out what is there. So you can drop some things, but this is the notation, right? So I have now P one by two, but I also have another five P state, which has two uh, P and J is equal to three by two, right? So uh, this is what my energy level structure looks like just uh, uh, as of now. Um, now what do I do? So now uh, and this also we. Uh, Let's write it for once. Okay. Now let me tell you what are the numbers. So this transition, which is what we will be mostly interested in, this is around 780 nanometers wavelength. The other one is a 795. I'm not labeling that. And this is the one we will use mostly for uh, laser cooling. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Good. Okay. What else we need? Ah, so now, now, so this part is done. So now we want to look at a finer interaction, right? So the final. So uh, remember, I told you I don't write it down, but that there is this pin and there is uh, the the 
uh, relativistic effects. So three things uh, go, have gone in here to make this energy level look, look like this. Of course, there's this E square over R, sort of E square over, let's call it Coulomb uh, part, uh, but not exactly Coulomb. Uh, but plus it what you have done is you have taken into account this coupling between the electron spin and the, uh, and the angular momentum of the orbital angular moment of the electron that has gone. This is called spin orbit coupling. You have also taken into account the relativistic uh, part, which is for which goes basically as uh, some v to the power four by c to the power four. So if you go instead of doing a Schrodinger equation, if you write to go into uh, uh, if you assume that the velocity can be relativistic, uh, there is a small correction, but nevertheless uh, there is a correction. And typically these two corrections, the relativistic correction due to the energy Bohr energy level diagram, the hydrogen kind of energy level diagram, uh, the uh, the magnitude of this and the magnitude of the spin orbit coupling is of the same order and what uh, and therefore you typically call them together and this is called a fine structure uh, so uh, so this is actually my fine structure what i have drawn here these two j's having different energy levels is what is uh, what causes this is this this thing what uh, if you want to understand what is this ls coupling you can think of this electron which is uh, 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 which is moving actually uh, it has a charge it's moving it has a spin, which has a spin meaning uh, it means uh, it has a dipole moment, right? So if you now invert the problem and think that of the electron is stationary and it is actually bound to a nucleus, right? So you, in its frame, the nucleus will appear to be moving. So this moving nucleus will produce some magnetic field, simple uh, uh, basic physics, right? Mu zero I by twice, that kind of field. And this electron spin mu will elect, interact with this magnetic field similar to this mu dot b kind of interaction. And what is mu? Mu is some, uh, some uh, constant times the spin of the electron. So it's s. And this orbital motion, is, of course, if you do the math, it will just have some angular momentum. Right? So it's moving the electron nucleus. That will give you this uh, L dot s uh, kind of term. And, uh, and that's called the spin orbit coupling. OK. Now, uh, if you go, if you look more finely, if you look go, even go uh, finer, then what will happen is that this nucleus, which now uh, was, uh, uh, which is there, this might have some nuclear spin. So you have some uh, nuclear spin I. Therefore, it will have some uh, nuclear uh, magnetic moment, right? So this nuclear magnetic moment will be, will be some, so let's say gamma prime uh, times the nuclear magnetic moment. Uh, uh, the, the nuclear spin I. Turns out that this number is much smaller than uh, the electron spin. It's smaller by the mass ratio of the proton to the neutron. So it's a very small uh, 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 number, magnetic moment, but it can, therefore it will split the energy levels by small amount, but it will split. So uh, uh, so what how what is happening here is the following that uh, the you should think of, uh, can probably think of it as a nucleus, which has some uh, 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 nucleus spin i, and there is an electron which is moving around, right? This electron has some spin s. Now, uh, the, uh, so the uh, interaction, this electron, remember, suppose it's a s, s electron. The s electron is not moving in an orbit like this. There is a finite probability of finding this electron. It's a, it's a Gaussian shape. So, the finite probability to find it even on top of the nucleus, right? So if you, so, so this total magnetization that this spin has is gamma s, right? So this m is, for the spin is uh, uh, of the order uh, gamma s, but this is spread out over this whole uh, wave function. So if I, if I say that, okay, I want, I'm interested in what is the sort of, what is the magnetization around this region? Why am I interested in this? If there is a magnetization there, uh, then I know that this, this magnetic field, this magnetization will produce is of, is proportional to actually M with some constant. This is from classical electrodynamics. I think it's two by three or something, uh, mu zero. So, uh, so this magnetic moment that the elect, uh, this spin produces in near the nucleus will now interact with this nuclear moment and give you uh, energy, uh, some energy, mu dot B. So what will that be? So this M is actually proportional to S Therefore, this mu n uh, uh, dot uh, b will be of the order of mu n is i and uh, 
uh, this is it. So this will be some interaction which is I dot S. Right? So this is another energy scale with some constant. So let this constant is A. Let's call it A. It's typically what is this? Um, note that it is essential that this uh, there is some probability of finding has to be some probability of the finding the electron in the uh, in the nucleus region, right? And this is highest for S state. You go to P state, D state, this probability reduces. So the hyperfine state uh, level, uh, splitting or this energy scale is the largest for the ground state, which is the S state. Yeah. So if I you are looking at here, it is the ground state, the highest here. So uh, I we can do the one can do this math, and I'm not going to uh, do this. But uh, what will then uh, my energy level now finally look like? My energy will basically split here again. This small splitting. This is this energy level diagram is by no way to scale, right? So the 7, 8, 80 nanometer is actually 3, 8, 4 uh, uh, terahertz, 10 to the power 12 hertz, right? Uh, or, uh, okay, let's write it in something like this, gigahertz, 0, 0, 0 gigahertz. Um, and uh, this splitting, so in the ground state, Let's say now this splitting will depend now on the isotope. The isotope effect which is going to come in, which is because these different isotopes have different nuclear spin, right? Because the, the nucleus of rubidium 87 is different from 85, right? Because a different number of neutrons, right? So therefore the nuclear spin uh, will, be, uh, will be different. Therefore this energy splitting will be different for the isotope. So before this, there was no isotope dependence. There was a small difference which would come from the mass of the isotopes. But uh, apart from that, the, the energy levels would probably shift. But now you have a really uh, isotope dependent effect that is because of the hyper, this is, this is called the hyperfine uh, interaction. Right. So, uh, so what will, uh, so I dot is, so, uh, so I have to, uh, what are the new, basically I will now look at what are the new angular momentum, another scheme like we did for this one to level. So now I have, I already had J, which was uh, here, this uh, one by uh, this fellow here, but now I have an extra uh, angular momentum, which is the spin. So I have to add up these fellows, J plus I, and this gives me F, which is called the hyperfine uh, quantum number, right, F. So, uh, so I have to add, and so suppose uh, I do it for this uh, S state. Right, so S state, uh, I had, uh, I knew that J was equal to uh, how much? One by two. Suppose I take rubidium 87. So let's say I, I'm looking at 87 rubidium. I have to specify now the isotope because of the nuclear spin. This has nuclear spin three by two, right? So what are, uh, so I have I equal to three by two. So what are my F values? These are three by two plus one by two, which is uh, by two. So it is two and one, right? So this will split into two levels, uh, F equal to one and F equal to two, right? Typically uh, this uh, it depends on what is the sign of this A, it could, which one is higher, which one is lower, it depends on that, but it will split. And the splitting will be this, this by this amount, I dot right? And how much is this splitting? This splitting in a rubidium 87 is 6.8 gigahertz. So it's very small compared to this splitting. This, this is caused by a laser. So you'll have something like a visible radiation or near IR radiation. This is a, a radio frequency, microwave kind of radiation. This is a typical order for, uh, for any alkali. It will, may not be six, maybe one, maybe, maybe nine or maybe something like that. But it is of that order, right? which is much smaller than here. So if you look at the other states, P states, they will also split. So see, for the P, for P one by two, I, J is again one by two. So it, it basically split like the S state and will have two energy levels. Again, F will be equal to uh, same uh, one and two. Uh, J equal to three by two. If you look at the P uh, three by two state, then J will be equal to three by two. And I is of course uh, also three by two. So I have uh, F, which is equal to uh, the question. So we have F, which is equal to three, uh, 
two, one, and zero. Right now it's good. So I have four levels now. F equal to four. Oh, sorry, f equal to three, two, one, and zero. Uh, let's level them by f prime just so that we uh, uh, know that when I say f to f prime, it means f prime is an excited state. So, so now I think this is this is all the what the energy level of a typical alkali looks like in absence of any other field. It's they just the atom placed in uh, in a vacuum chamber which has nothing else. Now we will uh, sort of we said that we of course will be starting to talk about Zeeman effect. So you can put these atoms in electric fields, magnetic fields, and uh, then change their energy level. Energy levels, right? So uh, before uh, and that is uh, the, so the re uh, so reason we want to go. We'll probably not talk much about the electric field, DC electric field. You can also do an AC electric field, right? You can do so. You can do put in different kinds of fields. So we'll. Talk about magnetic field because we know that we need that for specifically for laser cooling. <clears throat> um, uh, but the electric field also can be worked out, and the ideas will be similar. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so, so far, any questions? Is that actually we are building the Hamiltonian in that way? Like we start from Coulomb, uh, an LS, we include the LS interaction and uh, we do the relativistic correction. Is you there mean, is you, there any other like uh, you, could, you could yeah we we were more familiar with uh, uh, non relativistic uh, Hamiltonian, so we know the Schrodinger equations. So I'm assuming that we everybody then at least a bachelor's knows the uh, Schrodinger equation. So you, this is the typical way one introduces instead of just putting an putting a, a, a equation and then trying to solve it. So, uh, and this, uh, we would like to do it in this way also because it's easier to think of and relate to I, If I do a, just a, a, a start with the equation and solve it, I will we ha have a very hard time finding a correction with connection between hydrogen and let's say uh, alkali. This also le lets me pick up from what something I, which I know, add something and try to get, uh, get numbers which are good enough, but yes, you, uh, in the most fancy calculations, this is not how it is done. You start actually with a fancier thing, but the numbers sort of, uh, if you are not worried about precision, uh, and the, the, instead of 6.8, it will be 6.85, something like that. So uh, the numbers are very good, which comes out from this. Are pretty good. Okay, so first of all, note that hydrogen atom in the ground state is a S state, right? It has no P state, right? In the S state. So I am still talking about sort of the n equal to five for rubidium, which is the principal quantum number of the first valence electron. I'm not changing n. I'm only changing the angular part, right? With the laser. Of course, rubidium will have other. So next state is actually a 4D state, where the n is different. And this, by the way, you know that this energy levels will. It's not like after n all the n equal to five, then n equal to six star. It's not like that. It's jumbled up. But we are uh, considering only the n equal to five principal quantum. Hydrogen, of course, one s has not, nothing else where it, you can go to, right? It doesn't have a one p. So uh, laser cooling of hydrogen is difficult. First, of all. there's another problem is that the next state, if you want to go from one s to two s, that is a highly forbidden transition. That doesn't is not allowed by selection. So you could uh, so then, but you could do one uh, s to two p. This energy is huge. And people try to do it, but it's it's a, it's a laser which requires 10, 10 EV kind of thing. So, in terms of uh, 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 laser requirements, your it's a very difficult experiment. So people actually, when laser cooling started, so there was there were people like Daniel Kleppner, who actually bet on hydrogen to do laser cooling. And the reason is that hydrogen is the lightest fellow, right? So among all this, and I'm using photon momentum. So photon is very small. The, I, I think that the idea was that it's a small mass I want to start with. Therefore, I will be easier. It will be easier to cool. So he uh, basically, although there was challenges with lasers, they, it was tried. And uh, uh, so um, the problem of this, some details matter. So when they tried to do evaporative cooling, there is something called scattering length, which was not favorable for hydrogen. So they could not get, so they could laser cool uh, hydrogen, but they are, but they, it was not. They could people at that time were uh, 1990, uh, early 1990s. They wanted to do a 
both sides and condensation. So it turned out doing a BEC for hydrogen was very difficult. So other alkali atoms which have similar structure, actually sodium uh, and rubidium, these, these things were done first, right? So, uh, but uh, so in 1995-ish kind of thing, but uh, Dan Klepner did a hydrogen uh, cooling. I think uh, I've heard that when he presented this in a, some uh, conference, which is uh, the annual meeting of the uh, atomic physics in uh, America, he basically got a standing ovation. It's a very, very, uh, very difficult ex experiment to do. There are lots of technical challenges. So you will hardly hear anybody doing uh, laser cooling of hydrogen atoms, right? Yeah. Okay, so yes. Hello. Why you are you using the 780 transition for laser cooling? Why not 795? I'll 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 I'm going to I'm going to talk about this. Okay, okay, thank you. Sir. So this. Okay, uh, so I'll talk about it after I do the magnitude. I'll talk in details. Okay. Or. Maybe it's better to just do it this way. Or maybe let's let's start since you asked, let's maybe just do the uh, the light interaction part. So okay, so so far this is the atom. Uh, let us let us wait on this Zeeman effect. Let us talk about this a little bit later. Uh, uh, what happens when you put in a field? Uh, uh, or maybe no, it's just okay. Let me just finish off the Zeeman effect. This, so, okay, so this is this energy level. So, Zeeman effect uh, is what I'm talking about. So, uh, what? Uh, so, this effect is basically, as I said, it is an electron spin. A spin has a magnetic moment, and therefore, it can interact with an external magnet. Right? This is Zeeman effect. Um, typically, you would just write uh, a, a mu. Uh, of this, let's say, spin uh, uh, magnetic moment of the spin in an external uh, in an external field. So let's so so this is due to an external field. Earlier there are also fields, but there there were uh, fields generated inside the system. So the inside the alkali. Now we are putting an external with some uh, bringing a bar magnet or putting a solenoid or something and putting an external. So what happens? So the electrons spin has a magnetic moment, it will react to this magnetic field and the interaction is mu dot b, dipole, right, dipole interaction. If it was a di electric dipole, electric dipole, it would be d dot e, uh, d dot e instead of b and that is what uh, it would react uh, to an electric field. So we will not look at that, but there are similar things you can try to look at, uh, do. So, <clears throat> so uh, but this is not the only thing that is there, so right. Because the there is this uh, electron which is orbiting around, so there is some uh, orbital part of this uh, motion. So the magnetic moment arising from this electron spinning around the nucleus, and uh, so if you club them together, then this interaction will be uh, mu dot this sum of this, thing, right? Now uh, this is this is okay. So this is the gamma that was I was writing gamma times s. So this is minus mu dot b minus mu dot l. So this gamma is actually e by m for the elect for the spin part multiplied by s. Here it is e by two m. So there is a uh, there is a difference between in this gamma and this can this is not really explained in terms of uh, in uh, in non relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation. We have to uh, it comes from uh, Relativity is that factor of two for the spin, but in in our case we just put it by hand, so they are different. So uh, what uh, so what uh, if when I add the, so if I do so if I write them together, then this will be some e of e by uh, m. So what it it will be e by let's say right, I write e by two m, then this will be um, l plus two s kind of interaction, right? dot b. So uh, this is my uh, interaction uh, of the L, uh, when I consider L and S together, the magnetic moments are arising from both together. Um, how do you, so this will create, give you some energy, right? Uh, so like we did, we said that 
So this a dot j, for example, gave a i dot a i dot s gave you some energy splitting. How do you do? How do you calculate this energy splitting? You take whatever your energy levels was here, and then you use first order lesser perturbation theory. And this you would consider as a perturbing perturbation Hamiltonian, and find the expectation value of that perturbation Hamiltonian that will give you the first order correction to the energy. And that is what I have written there. You do a similar thing for this fellow. So you consider this as a uh, perturbation, let's say, right? And try to try to calculate it. Now, whenever you say that it's per perturbation, you have to say that okay, this perturbation is small compared to something, right? And if it is a very large number, then you cannot really consider it as a perturbation. So there are different energy scales. We know these are what, what it is. So if it is very suppose this is a very large number, actually, and it's so large that uh, it is larger than even this splitting, let's say this hyper this fine structure splitting, right? So actually, in that case, you don't need this. These J levels are not what are the good levels because the perturbation Hamiltonian itself is more larger than this. So actually, you just start with the N L states. So you say that I have five P state, five S state. No, forget about J. And then you find to first order. This is the biggest additional term. So you find out what is the correction this will provide for the N L states, right? And that is easy because uh, that easy to calculate from this one. So you know the, this is uh, L. I, if I sandwich it in between some N, uh, some N L kind of state, I know I'll get the expectation value of it. So suppose this was suppose my magnetic field was in the uh, Z direction. So suppose B was in the uh, uh, Z cap direction. Then I have. Uh, uh, yeah, so then I have this, I have some interaction, which is this constant times LZ plus twice SZ times B, right? Now it is LZ, I know if I put, put in an L state and I do my first order, uh, but, uh, using for the first order perturbation theory, this LZ is, uh, it will give, when I sandwich it, it will just give me ML, right? Similarly, if I sandwich a, S between, here I'll just get M S. So it's an easy thing to find out. This is the first, this is going to be my correction, which will, go, which will be basically ML plus twice M S. This will be a correction to my energy E by the first order. On top, so this is a very high field. So what I'm this is the high field region, right? Now this this is what is going to be split the energy levels uh, uh, in this form, depending on what is the L S and so on. And then if you now want to say, okay, no, now I want to calculate what are the, what is the effect of this relativistic correction uh, L dot S. So those are all smaller energy scales. So you have to find that using uh, uh, perturbation theory. But this is not the regime which you typically uh, sort of most laser cooling experiment, not in this. What you are in is a very low, low field, very low field region, right? So what you actually have is you have this whole structure given to you and you have to apply a weak magnetic field, right? So my, actually my good states, in if, I, uh, if in a low field are, uh, so if I have low field, it's uh, different. And I don't think, I should go into the details of this. Uh, what 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 will in my energy splitting is basically linear in magnetic field. So if I find out, uh, so I have to I have to also include remember uh, the nuclear moment mu i dot b, but nuclear moment is very small, so I can forget about this. So my uh, actually my total magnetic moment will be similar to this, but the only difference is that instead of using the NL states, I have to use this F M S states, right? So this F and M S, so uh, yes, which are my good states in the presence of all these interaction, hyperfine, spin orbit, relativistic correction, those are the states I need to look at. So I use the same Hamiltonian and when I have to find the correction, I use F, M F and the first order, I find the correction uh, uh, of the state. It turns out that this, uh, this Riemann Hamiltonian is, uh, is basically some, uh, Okay, uh, mu b g f b 
and MS. Okay, it, just, uh, it, it depends on uh, uh, the Bohr magneton mu v, right? E h bar by two m. Uh, 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 the something called GF, which is the uh, uh, Okay, the GF is a complicated, if you do the math, it's a complicated looking thing, but ultimately it is a sum of, so where does it, you'll have some F into F plus one minus I into I plus one. So this is going to come from all these I dot SS, uh, when, you, uh, when, you, when you write them and try to find out the perturbation, you can write this I dot S as, so you can, you know that, uh, for example, here, um, uh, F is equal to, let's say, uh, uh, whatever, let's say f equal to j plus i, uh, i dot j, sorry, this should have been j. Uh, so you know that I can, uh, I can, uh, I, if I square it, then I get a square, which is equal to j square plus, uh, let's say, i square plus uh, twice j dot i. Uh, so j dot i is basically a square minus j square minus i square. And then if I, I know what are the quantum numbers, it will be some f into f plus one it's easier to compute. So you will basically this GF will have all these numbers, but at the end of the day, this GF will turn out to be order of one. Okay. Um, so I will write down uh, the, this for a few uh, uh, states. So if you look at rubidium 87 in particular, okay. so if you look at, uh, I'm interested in, let's say the five uh, S state, right? Uh, GF is uh, of the order uh, is half. And if you look, so this, remember this S state has two levels, right? It has uh, uh, F equal to, uh, uh, it has F equal to two state and F equal to one state, right? So if I, have to, if I multiply GF times MF, maximum value of that, right? So for F equal to two, the MF is uh, two. Right, so this is actually equal to one. Right, really, if equal to one, this GF is uh, uh, actually minus one by two. Uh, uh, you can multiply uh, if and find something; it will not be one. But I'll tell you why I am writing one there in a short while. Right? But this number is of the order of one. If you look at the five p three by two state, and if you look at the highest, highest, so this F two was highest F value here, and if you look at the F equal to three state there, which is the highest energy level over there maximum value of F, um, uh, uh, this GF is uh, two by three. And if you multiply them, GF uh, time MF max, then this is actually uh, two. So if you look at the Zeeman splitting of this level, uh, I'm not writing the other levels, but if you look at the Zeeman splitting, so both of them will be linear, right? And you have a GF time MF times B. So if you put this atom in a magnetic field, one will split at double the amount. You take a difference, right, of these two energy splitting. So both, both are going up, one is going at a faster and one is going up slower. You take a difference between these two energy levels, you basically get exactly one. So you will have a energy difference, which is one times mu beta. So, and this is what we'll use in this Zeeman, uh, in, in a Z, use the Zeeman effect in a Zeeman store, right? So that's why I wanted to point in this point this out. Okay, any questions at this point? Uh, values, you I mean what? Uh, so um, can you rephrase the question? Huh. Okay, uh, okay, you want the numbers. Yeah, yeah, so this will be, let's say, a few goals. I mean, let's say this is very low field. I, yeah, let's say, let's say less than, let's say five goals. That fellow will be, uh, this will be huge, right? This, this needs to be, this field needs to be many, many hours. It has to be sort of comparable to the, uh, so it, it, is, it is a perturbative approach. So you have to basically see what is the energy scale where, I don't know, clear cutoff, but uh, uh, you have to look at the energy scale. So that defined, the for different system will be slightly different. But yeah, low field may be five cost hours. But the important thing is that, uh, for the, so it turns out that for the uh, highest energy state, if, uh, if one MF state is going up, the, the, that those two states that we have made more prominent than the others, they actually sort of keep going up linearly, okay? Even at relatively high uh, fields. So if you go to even uh, 100 hours, it is uh, similar. 
Okay. Uh, good. So um, now let us start. Uh, now let us start our discussion on the uh, third part, which is which I need is the two level system, right? Uh, so I want my uh, uh, I want to uh, look at the interaction of uh, uh, of a of a atom in the field in a in a field, right? So. Uh, what we will consider is basically known as a semi classical approach where the energy levels of the atom are quantized, but the light is not. I know we, I already used that photon analogy, so that's already not the correct thing, to, but we'll develop it in a so we'll not be very strict about how we are developing it. So, right now, what we'll do is for you know, a semi classical approach. But the atom energy levels are quantized, but the field is not quantized, right? But if we take B low in the first case, ah. then what will happen? I mean, why it is a high field limit and why? Okay, so uh, see, you system? could have Bs. Uh, so, okay, maybe I confused you people. Uh, uh, so, I could have B uh, in the difference. So, this external field could be B could be 1 Gauss. B could also be, uh, it could also be 100 Gauss. It could also be 1 Tesla, like 10 to the power 4 Gauss. Right? Depending on how strong my B is, it will have different uh, effect on my energy level structure, right? So I want to, before I start doing anything, I want to know of a, approximately what, what is this, how do I approach? If I am approaching in this perturbation theory approach, uh, how do I solve this problem? So if I'm at a very high field, then I need not worry about this small energy splittings, right? And these are actually not even going to be my good quantum. So I start basically with, I, but I will always have this, uh, uh, electron moving around the nucleus that I have, right? Unless you, uh, I mean, if you have a very strong electric field, you can just pull, think that I will pull the electron out of the nucleus. This is actually quite a huge, huge field, but the magnetic field, if it's very high, then you don't need not worry. Uh, so then you will try to, you will try to this fellow plus your, let's say, let's, let's call it H bohr as the, uh, the Coulomb part and just the Coulomb part. This is my, Total Hamiltonian, right? But this H bore, uh, this is this. I know the energy level structure for this. This is just N L, and then they, if they spin this S and all this thing. But I know the energy level S P D and, and so on, right? So uh, and I want to know if I put put this uh, this in in the Z direction field, then this what I get is L Z plus two S. So actually, I know if I if I if I put an atom in in this state, and I suppose I, if I just do NL, right, then I know this LZ is actually a good, uh, can give me a, because this NL will have this ML state. So all this, uh, so this is an eigenstate of this uh, L state. So I just get out uh, uh, ML and then two MS. And then if I want to correct now, now suppose you want to say, okay, I have some, this hard large field, but now I want to know what are the corrections coming from this hyperfine interaction or uh, before that the fine structure interaction, then I use these, uh, I use perturbation theory for these, right? Yeah. So then I will use this, so first I will solve this uh, L dot S, what is the, uh, what is the perturbation coming from that? If I am not happy with it, I'll go to the, uh, yeah, to keep correcting it. On the low field region, if the field is very small, then okay, uh, what do I mean by very small? Very small compared to Let's say in the ground state compared to this energy difference, right? Then I should have this whole energy level structure, and then I am putting a magnetic field. So this field, in presence of magnetic field, will now split, right? And it will now become like this bad catch. So it will just split in magnetic field. And this has how many? Huh, this is one. it will split in different. These are the different MF states. MF equal to two and so on. That's the low field, the linear in magnetic field. Okay. Okay. Good. So, okay, back to this fellow. 
So now I want to consider the atom interacting with light. So what is happening? You put an atom in a, in a light field. Uh, uh, suppose this wavelength of this light, the lambda of this light, is very large compared to what? Compared to the size of the atom, it is very easy to satisfy. The atom is just a angstrom kind of thing. Wavelength of light that we will use 780 nanometers say is huge compared to that, right? So it's a time. So this is valid. So if you place the atom anywhere, you can assume that the amplitude of this uh, electric field around that place is not uh, changing. So there is no spatial dependence of the electric field. So the electric field is more or less spatial, uh, the same amplitude. But I have I have the atom here, but the field has a so the elect a plane. Suppose it's a plane wave. So it's a, it has a z e to the power i omega two minus k minus omega t minus k. So I'm saying that that this z I have located localized z, then therefore this, this e is not changing much over there. So I can forget about the spatial variation. But there is a t. So there is a time variation of the electric field. So basically the atom uh, is basically seeing that the electric field is going up and down. As you know, I mean the, it will, the electric field oscillates. So basically it sees a e zero cos omega t kind of oscillation, right? So if you have this E0, so, so, so what we have is basically some electric field. We forget about uh, the spatial variation. And this, by the way, is called uh, dipole approximation. Uh, uh, yeah, dipole approximation. I mean, uh, you can come at it in a different way. So people typically will write as e to, e to the power i k dot x, expand it, and uh, show you that, OK, this is actually just the first term in that expansion. Uh, uh, are uh, kind of thing, but uh, this is the physical, uh, basically the uh, ultimate thing. Uh, so now in this electric field, this uh, uh, so okay. So now uh, I want. So now what is happening? There is a nucleus which is heavier than the electron, right? So uh, the electron responds much faster than the nucleus. Therefore, there will be sort of a charge separation. So the, 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 probably the electron can go farther away from the nucleus, and therefore there is basically a the, the, the electron wave function basically is getting distorted. It's not, suppose it was a S state that's spherically symmetric given. Now, uh, or a P state, which is uh, some looking like something like a dumbbell, you, you put an electric field, the electron goes further away. So, it, so the charge separation gets distorted. This induces to the first order a dipole moment. Right? So, that is this, uh, uh, so this is this dipole moment in the dipole approximation. You can have higher moments, right? But those will be smaller in a case. Right? So uh, we just restrict, let's say, to the, the dipole moment created by this electric. Uh, so then now we have a uh, we have a dipole in an electric field, and we know what is the interaction. It is uh, it is simply uh, minus d dot e, right? And uh, let's call this interaction. What is this D? D is, you know, D is this. Uh, uh, so, this is suppose this is a nucleus and you have pulled the electron out somewhere. So, this distance of this nucleus basically uh, of the electron from the nucleus, let's call it R. And so, the charge is basically the electron charge. So this D is E times R. So, this is this is this is essentially equal to minus E R dot E. And let me just write down E uh, zero cos omega t. So I have my full uh, full atomic structure like that, and now I'm adding this as a perturbation. Now. This is my interaction Hamiltonian. Okay, what is different in this case? The difference between the Zeeman shift and this one is now I have an explicit time difference. So while you use, use a time independent perturbation theory approach to approach that problem, here you have to do a time dependent perturbation theory. If you want. So and what does this time dependence add to the system? What it adds is transitions. So in this picture, when you had these energy levels, and if I had no time dependent field, and if I had not told you that there is anything called spontaneous emission, um, if you put an atom in any state, doesn't matter, let's say this state, which is not a ground state, it's an eigenstate of the system, it will stay there forever. Right? So if you put, so there is no way for it to make a transition. We know, yeah, I know intuitively you know that it will be okay, but that's not, that's not what the Schrodinger equation tells you, right? So that comes from something. So, so if you want to call the transition from any of these levels, you need this time. So, and this is what this is why this is what this slide will provide. Um, and 
okay so uh, okay let me say us first summarize what we will do so there are three things you will see um i have this uh, uh, frequency of the laser right or frequency of this radiation omega i can come uh, so if i now let, let's uh, let's say i am only consider going to consider a two level system one and two why can i consider a two level system even though my energy level structure is so difficult uh, so complicated that's because i can choose my laser frequency to be very close to resonance with one of them and then forget about all the other energy levels right so this is what uh, is an approximation and it works for uh, a lot of things uh, so i have my uh, uh, so let's call this energy difference h bar omega 0 omega 0 uh, so basically the energy difference divided by h bar is the omega 0 is the angular frequency unit so basically you can think of it as a natural frequency of an oscillator a two level system you can also think of it as an oscillator there are many ways you can actually two, a two level energy levels like that i have drawn for a hydrogen atom you can also think of a spin spin is a two level system you put in a magnetic field it will split into two and the energy scale associated with that that is the in h bar omega you can even think of this you can people also can try to motivate you that you see if you have a uh, let's say a lc oscillator right you know if you have an lc oscillation it has a resonant frequency right? and uh, actually superconducting uh, qubit which is used uh, in quantum computing and all these things they use lc oscillations so there is a h bar omega zero natural resonant frequency of the system and the system oscillates so uh, and that therefore that can also be mapped into a two level system so there are a wide variety of problems which can actually be mapped onto a two level system and uh, you once you understand this and you just can apply it to the, all, all the other ones and uh, so, uh, so so remember now L, since i said lc oscillation see lc oscillations you induce the oscillation keeps going on right that nothing decays but the moment you add a resistor to it there will be a decay of the energy so what is missing in this uh, what, what you do by adding a resistor in a lc circuit is what you would need in this experiment is spontaneous emission which you have to add by hand so that will be a damping term right so that is not there in this one anyway back to two level system yeah uh, so uh, it will so now i have a choice of this omega so if omega is around omega 0 so this laser frequency this omega is the laser frequency and uh, this i said is the natural frequency of the system then what it does is the primary effect of this field is actually to cause transitions it'll take you from this state to that state back to this state and so on if if you are very far from omega 0 is uh, not on resonance this is a resonance condition right uh, at some frequency you have a highest response of the system uh, on resonance then what it does is it shifts the energy uh, energy so the energy let's like shift energy these energy levels it shifts and this is proportional to this e square let's say e zero square so the primary this is the primary thing that is not the only thing but this is the most important thing. It shift energy not it does not cause transition because my laser is not on resonance is far away or far far from here to here or from here to here it will shift the energy level the energy levels will not be exactly this it will be slightly different depending on what is the e zero square which is the intensity of the laser right e zero square has units of uh, i um in the, i mean divided by all the area so um, the third thing uh, it will do is it will give you selection tools So this uh, uh, this perturbation and this interaction will give selection. How so? So if I uh, where is the selection rules? Uh, where are they? Where are they coming from? So what I do is suppose I, in this H interaction I just I do basically nothing. I just I say that this I will write as I'll just in, insert two identity operators. Let's say uh, so if I even if I have uh, many states I'll just introduce let's say uh, uh, let's say f f then uh, one identity here and another identity on uh, on this uh, this side right i have done nothing to the hi but in writing in this way what i have done is i have found i have found a matrix element i have one state i another state f i will sum over all of them right fine 
so but uh, you see for this uh, um, unless this fellow is non zero right you don't have a transition right so you may this will define so this matrix element better be non zero uh, if you want to have a transition from any state to another one state to another state right? and this is what will give you the selection so i think this uh, you have probably this is, these are electric dipole selection rules which you probably have already seen similar to whatever you have looked at hydrogen atom all the things will apply um, but you will have slightly more complicated things because of the hyperfine and all so what are the these selection rules uh, the first thing is that uh, this will give you delta l equal to uh, uh, sorry delta l not delta s delta l equal to plus minus 1 so uh, the orbital angular momentum can change by one unit right that's what it will give you it will tell you that this s cannot change because this electric field uh, this hamiltonian which is a perturbing hamiltonian now does not have any spin dependence so it does not alter the spin in some sense. Um, uh, similarly it will have uh, uh, delta j is actually zero or plus minus one um, except that uh, j equal to zero to j prime equal to zero is not allowed right? and we had also uh, our delta f selection rules which is also going to be zero plus minus one and f equal to zero to f prime equal to zero is not you have similar selection rule for mf also or ml mj right and uh, these uh, uh, this mf or ml or this selection rule depends on the polarization of light okay so what is the polarization of light it is this coming going to come from this E0, which is a vector right now, so depending on whether the how the electric field is oriented, whether it's just a linearly polarized light or a circularly polarized light or so on, uh, that so you know, I mean, you can map it into a spheric sort of a spherical harmonic. So, this the spherical harmonic basically come into play. And uh, you, uh, depending on uh, on what, so if you have a light which is right circularly polarized, you have, uh, uh, let's say, delta MF or even MJ, whatever you want, they are all this have. Have to be plus one. If you have a sigma minus uh, polarization, then this delta mf has to be minus one. And if you have a, a linear polarization, uh, then your delta f, a, mf has to be equal to zero. Okay. So now uh, uh, this at this point, uh, I can answer one of the questions which was asked: that why are we considering this transition? So remember what we want. We want that the atom once it goes from this state to uh, that uh, state it comes back exactly to this state and not to any other state and this transition will allow us to do this so if you have your uh, if you have a laser which is tuned from here to around here so if the atom starts out here you can uh, you can go to f equal to 3 that is allowed delta f equal to 1 go there uh, all the other things will be allowed see the s delta l has changed by one you can check all these things will be allowed j is also changed by one and so on uh, now one the atom will not stay there we suppose there is spontaneous emission the real system is some spontaneous emission which we will uh, will forget our spontaneous emission again but like right now since i'm answering the question it could emit it could come back to uh, f equal to two Right, yeah, it can it can come back to f equal to two because that is allowed. But from f equal to three, it cannot come to f equal to one because that is delta f equal to two. So you have very special energy level structure. So I have basically something called a closed a cycling transition, closed cycle, closed transition. So if I excite atoms from here to there, it will come back all to the same state. That you will not be able to do here on the d d one transition, right? Uh, Okay, so in a real, of course, in the real atom, you know, this 6.8 gigahertz, if you have this vapor of atom or this beam of atom coming in, it could be any of these two states because uh, there is some thermal vapor, it has some thermal energy, uh, but it has, does not have so much energy that is in the excited state, right? This, this energy, if I write it down in terms of uh, EV, this is around 1.5 EV. If I write in terms of temperature, KBT, it's very high, more than, more than 10,000, right? Yeah, Kelvin. So that what is coming out is basically in the, this ground state, but it could be in any of these two states. And it's, uh, this is an energy scale where actually both of them are equally populated. 
Or what is the population is e to the power this is the e to the power minus beta where this one mark one over kvt times the energy difference right that is the statistical mechanically how you find out what is the probability of finding a state right depending on energy so they are they are equally populated so in fact there will be atoms here so uh, what do you do about those atoms you basically put another weak laser uh, let's say it is attuned to from here to let's say here they are f equal to 1 to f equal to 2 so from 2 it can come back to 1 also but it can also go back to 2 right um, if it uh, so once it goes back to two, it falls in the cycling transition and starts uh, absorbing. So you are basically off. so this is a one one way one level of optical pumping. You have just uh, introduced a laser which has pumped your system to a different uh, state, which is where it cycles. I don't know. You could also this uh, this is a very powerful technique because you could also now you put a magnetic field and then you have split the MF levels also. And now you have to satisfy for a different polarization of lights. You have to satisfy those MF selection rules. You can do an optical pumping also using those MF states, depending on what is your laser polarization. Right? Okay. So you and your question is answered. Okay. So now again, I will forget about uh, spontaneous emission. I'll bring it again back later. So suppose I have only these two system, which is interact this two level system interact interacting with interacting with the Hamiltonian. Um, so suppose my so suppose my without interaction my Hamiltonian was eight zero and it had it gave me some energy level E n and some eigenstates n right okay. now I want to know what is this uh, uh, h i doing right so this h uh, i which is now remember is a function of right so I have to find out the correction so what I do is I take any Suppose I have an, I have a system in an arbitrary state T, I can expand it in terms of this known eigenergies. In this case, I have only two levels, right? One and two, right? Ket one and ket two. So, uh, so now since it is a function of T, uh, you would, in general, you would, you know, the expansion would be something, some constant, let's say C1 e to the power. How do the energy levels evolve in terms of uh, in time? You know the, the, the evolution of the, the states are e to the power uh, minus i e n t by h bar. This is how it evolves in time. It's this is Schrodinger equation, and then time separation of variables, time part is taken away, and this is how you do. But now there is time. So, so this so the bear. If I look at the bear study, I would write try to write that this is make it look something uh, similar. Uh, uh, minus let's say i e1 t by h bar for state one, but I make this constant. So this alpha I can expand in c1 plus c2, right? And then c2 e to the power minus i e2 uh, t by h bar of two. Uh, this is what it would happen uh, if there was no time dependence. But now if there is time dependence, I make this coefficient time. And you could say that I will not write it in this form. I will just take this whole thing and write as a function of t c bar prime t that's also fine but this is uh, this is a nice way to write it because if you drop the time dependence you get back uh, your uh, uh, your the regular thing which you would get for non time dependent so this is this is how you basically for convenience you write it this way right so this will be my state of a system now what do i do i basically plug this in in the schrodinger equation um Okay, so so what I do is I apply. I'll not go through the but this I would like you to do it very rigorously uh, as a maths exercise. Uh, so you plug this in this uh, 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 so this total h zero plus h i um, and this alpha. Okay, so okay, uh, yeah, I don't want to do that much. So after you plug it in, what you will have terms which will uh, which will have some h zero i h i i and so on, right? Um, uh, so uh, similarly with with coefficient c one and c two and so on. So the first thing you do is uh, after doing this, 
you hit it with a bra of one from the left. And you just simplify this thing. Right? So what do you, when you bra, you also many, many terms. So suppose any term which was like H0, 1, 1, this will be 0. Or let's say HI, sorry, HI 1, 1, this will be 0. Uh, so you drop all those terms, right? And uh, what you will end up with is uh, an equation which looks like i h bar c1 dot is equal to c2 to the power minus i c2 minus e1 t by h bar 1. So these, what will survive are these fellows. The, Hamil the interaction Hamiltonian sandwiched between the two states. One and two. Okay. Uh, see the uh, the for the h zero actually when you sandwich h zero in between one and one it will be non zero and if you sandwich it between two different states, it will be zero. and and those those are taken care of in this u one and u two. You do not. This is what you will get. You will get a similar equation if you if you uh, hit it with a bra of two, but this c one dots will now be uh, c two dots, uh, so it, they will be interchanged. And this uh, e2 minus e1 will become e1 minus e2. So please check that. So uh, so this let's uh, let's, let's now define this um, e2 minus e1 by h bar h bar is that energy level h bar omega zero right? So this we can uh, define as uh, so h bar omega zero is equal to e2 minus e1. Right? So I have a e to the power i omega zero p kind of. Uh, evolution here. And uh, what do I have here? This fellow is now going to be one. And then I have a E, I'm writing just down the E zero. Um, uh, then the, the cos omega t, I'll just write, write it outside. This fellow is called, let's call it h bar omega, this is some energy, and this omega is called the Rabi frequency. I'll, and we'll see why it is called the Rabi frequency. And why is why it's, it's, of course, a few frequency in it, you'll see what this means. So, this interaction, remember, it depends on the strength of the interaction. E0 is nothing at the electric field. So, this gives you a, a, the energy scale, and this gives you a frequency, which is the interaction. Okay, so if you if you put this uh, simplification in, then uh, you will write you will get this again this i h bar c one dot you can write it as uh, omega cos omega t e to the power minus i omega zero t c two. Similarly, you will get another equation which is i h bar or for the second one, which is C2 dot is equal to omega star actually cos omega t e to the power i omega zero t t1. Now you have to solve this differential. This basically now is a problem of differential equation. You solve it. So what you do is you take a double derivative of this C1 dot, you will get C1 double dot, you will get a C2 dot. And blah blah blah. Even wherever you see a C two dot, you plug in this fellow on the on the right. That that depends basically on C one. So you can el eliminate one of those. You will get a second order differential equation in let's say C one dot or C two dot. So do this for C two dot. Eliminate C one dot. The reason is that what are the C is that uh, I'm asking you to do that is because suppose you wanted to start with a case where your initially the atom was here. Um, so you're at t equal to zero, the atom was in this state. That C1, uh, T equal to zero, if you look at the mod square of that, that is one, right? And because this uh, wave function of the state is normalized, uh, C2, t, uh, C2 at t equal to zero was zero, right? So, you, so I want to start with zero and I see how C2 evolves with time. So if you eliminate, C, uh, you just eliminate and find the differential equation of this one. Uh, uh, okay, so now what do I do? I think a lot of this can be erased. 
Okay, that should be enough, I guess, for now. Okay, so ultimately what you get, now this is the Rabi model again. Is the following that this C2 should find C2 and take a mod square of that. Um, I'll get omega square divided by omega square plus delta square. What is delta? Uh, delta is basically uh, omega minus omega zero. The laser frequency minus the resonance. Okay, so this is this comes out from the math, and so you you know that there are this there is omega zero and omega in uh, it there. Um, so actually, you have to do uh, uh, something which is known as the uh, rotating wave approximation. So this cos omega t, you write as e to the power i omega t plus e to the power minus i omega t divided by two. So now this e to the power i omega t, when you multiply, so this with e to the power minus i omega zero t, you will have either omega plus omega zero t or omega minus omega zero t. Right? So what you do is you drop the omega plus omega zero term. This is called the ro rotating wave approximation. So uh, what it means, okay, very difficult to you know, sort of picture. So, but if you uh, think about this spin uh, or this magnetic field, it is not so difficult. So suppose you have a very strong magnetic field, you put an electron spin or angular momentum. The electron spin over the magnetic field is in this direction. You put electric field. So what do, suppose the spin was in this direction. This strong field will precess around this magnetic field, right? So it has a precession frequency. That's, that is the natural frequency, omega zero. That is that mu dot b, that is the frequency, okay? Um, now you want to make a transition. Suppose I want to flip the spin instead of precessing like this, I want it to precess like this. That would be my plus half to minus half transition. So I, I said that this will happen. So in analogy, this will happen when I inter introduce some time dependent Hamiltonian. So in this spin case, this time dependent Hamiltonian can be introduced by having a small transverse field in not in this, this, this is a strong, very strong magnetic field, but you put a weak magnetic field in the transverse direction, but this is time dependent. This has to be a small time dependent. And one way to do it is that say, I, this magnetic field is not uh, time dependent, but this magnetic is rotating. Yes, it's also a time dependence, right? Suppose this rotation is at a frequency omega, which is my sort of my laser frequency, right? So you see, this will be a rotation frequency and this is a precision frequency. There's a very special condition when this precision frequency and this rotation frequency match, right? If they match, then I have a frame where I, everything appears static, right? So that the resonance where omega equal to omega zero, everything appears static. If I'm slightly off omega equal to omega zero, then one is one has this is slightly faster and the other is slightly slower. So if I will have two, if I if I do omega plus omega zero, I have a case which is very fast, and it will still time average out. What will matter is a small if the, the, the omega minus omega part. That is what is the response of the system. That is what will eventually give you uh, 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 if the physics you are interested in. And that is uh, that is basically a rotating wave approximation. So you drop one of the uh, so the spin half system is very neat. So if you want, you can just do it. Apply a small magnetic field in the uh, rotating magnetic field and do as with just with spins. Uh, uh, try to do it. It it works out beautifully. Okay. So the uh, I think we have stopped in some time. So this fellow, this Rabi fellow, uh, this is detuning is omega minus omega zero, and you will have a sine square, square root over this same thing, omega square plus delta square by two. So this is what C2T looks like, mod C2T square.
Uh, yeah, you can it can be real, but yeah, it's typically real. But yeah, I, I've defined it that way because uh, see, what will happen is that you will have this flip. Two will so when you multiply with that bra here, it will be a uh, two one five. So in generically, it is a, a omega star. Therefore, I will do it. But yeah, it'll turn out. It can be. It'll turn out to be real. So we, we only talk about Rabi frequency, we typically say omega and then we omega star, we don't call Rabi frequency. I mean, but yeah, it will be mostly uh, real. So don't uh, uh, worry about it. So you can drop it if you want. Okay, so uh, what uh, so what is what, what does it what what is the system doing now? So I have a dry, I have a two-level system, I have a drive which is at omega zero, and this is the probability of finding the system in state two. So suppose I look at a very special case, which is Delta equal to zero. That is omega drive frequency is equal to the resonant frequency. Immediately you see that if I put delta equal to zero, the amplitude becomes one. Right? So it's a one times sine omega t, right? So it's a sinusoidal oscillation with amplitude one, which means the probability of finding C2T or the system at state two at some point of time is going to be one. Right? It's simply uh, uh, basically so C2T mod square. Is simply equal to sine squared, right? So if I plot versus time my uh, c to t, remember at t equal to zero, I started with uh, the, the, I told you to put the condition that I'm starting with the system in state one. That of course at t equal to zero, that is why it's a sine actually. If you don't do it, it will be a cost. Um, so it'll, 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 it'll do this kind of oscillation. Right? And this amplitude is going to be one. So when is it going to be one? So that's simple, right? This omega, uh, omega t by two is equal to what? Pi by two or, or rather t is equal to uh, pi over omega. At that point of time, you have uh, 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 probability of finding the st in state two as one. This is called a pi pulse. If you put, uh, if you wait, half, you don't put omega t equal to pi by two, but you put pi by four, you will actually have mod c two square equal to half, which means mod c one square is equal to half, which means actually you put the system in a superposition, equal superposition of state one, on, one and two. So by timing for how much, how long we have pulsed on your laser, you can put the system in either state one, state two, any superposition of state one and state two. So this is how you control the system until two right? But just by timing the laser, keep the laser intensity fixed, time it. You can also play with the intensity, but even if you don't do it, you can you can just uh, then sure I'll finish in two minutes. Um, um okay, so uh, uh, uh Okay, so now if delta is not equal to zero, you see the amplitude is no longer one. So this is less than one. And the frequency of this oscillation increases. Right? So you will have uh, oscillations which are like this. So the probability of finding a system uh, in state two is never one at whatever time. So if you, uh, uh, so if you want to actually have a system exactly on two, uh, you have to be very close to resonance or near resonance. The other thing uh, to note here, so, is that uh, this, uh, if I plot the maximum value of this amplitude part, right? Uh, so if I, so this basically this, um, uh, this C2 took, took amplitude, so let's call it C2 to ma C2 uh, T mod ka maximum value, right? This is equal to uh, omega square since you're objecting to the, mod square, that's what it is. This delta is what? This is omega minus omega zero squared. So recognize this function. So if I plot this, this is as a function of omega, uh, omega, uh, this is omega zero. So it'll, it'll become one at one place and then it'll drop at omega minus omega zero and omega plus omega zero, it'll be half. Uh, this is a Lorentzian. Okay. So um, um, you see this width will increase 
what is omega omega is remember now this this sorry, there are so many omega this capital omega was dependent on uh, if you look at there it depends on this uh, age uh, e zero there right electric field square squared will come in if we need to capital omega squared so that is the uh, that is uh, so omega square depends on the intensity of the laser so if you make the omega intensity very large actually this width becomes large so you get a so if you want to really make a transition you make, better make omega large so that even if you are not exactly on the tuning you can still make the transition right and this also means uh, the, the reverse is also true that if you make the intensity very large you have something or some kind of a broadening of your spectrum and this will be this is basically power broadening so you will hear about power broadening and this is why it can be explained based on this kind of a two level system the only last comment is that note that for a two level system even though if i even if i keep applying this uh, drive for infinite amount of time the response of the system is finite it's not like it will only go from state 1 to 2 and come back there is a very special thing about two level system there is something called saturation if you had a harmonic oscillator with equally spaced levels you wouldn't have this saturation so it's absolutely important so uh, that you have some kind of a uh, you don't have a exact harmonic oscillator then it, it is not, does not work you have to have some kind of a set many things will depend on this so uh, yeah so i think uh, time is over so i think we'll stop here but i head towards t but if you have questions please either discuss there or burning questions anything online online should we ask or i don't know uh, I have no idea what what is going on on this. Is there any questions online? Okay. Ah, okay. So the question is about rotating wave approximation. So in this, okay. So the basic idea is that spin will also will have. Uh, okay, spin is a two two level system, right? Spin uh, is half, spin half is plus half or minus half. So I'm basically trying to say that. Um, so those those who have worked can uh, sort of want to go ahead outside. Go ahead. Um, so I'm thinking about trying to think about this classically. So I have a spin. I have two states in in, in a spin. Huh? I have two states basically. I'm, I'm only worried, worried about suppose I fix my quantization actually around the z direction. Suppose I have a strong magnetic field in the z direction. It's either up spin or down spin with respect to that. If I put a spin and say some, uh, I spin, uh, let's think of a spin is in this, in this, or angular momentum in this direction. If I have a strong magnet, it'll rotate. So this mu dot b, so a magnet in a magnetic field will precess around the magnetic field. This is what uh, will happen, right? And this precession frequency is omega zero. What is omega zero? In a, it turns out is nothing but this mu dot b term that the energy scale you get. So this omega, this is omega zero. The in a, in a energy. Uh, which the system has uh, in this field divided by h bar. Now this omega zero, I'll keep doing it, but now suppose I want to flip it. I want to make it rotate like this, which means I'll flip the spin from plus half to minus half. Right? On an average, I mean, if when it's rotating, I mean, see the only the, the transverse component averages out. So what only the projection along the z direction which survives. So basically I have essentially a spin pointing up. Um, uh, now uh, you see uh, if uh, if i want to make a transition what i'm saying is that you have to put a field in the transverse direction and it cannot be a static field because it has to be a field which is time dependent well with a static field your magnetic field will just change its direction and the pin will precess around that so what you have to do is you have to trans make the, if but if you make this field rotate so you can do a different kind of you can just make it oscillate and that's what the in the is done in experiments you just have a field in the transverse direction make it oscillate but even, even an oscillating field like this can be mapped into a ro two rotating one ro fields, one rotating clockwise and one rotating clock counterclockwise. So suppose for simplicity, I said that I have put a magnetic field it rotates in the transverse direction with some frequency omega, which in this case analogously will be the laser frequency. Right? If my laser this rotation frequency matches this natural frequency, right? And if so, you can think that they are moving to, together. And therefore, if I in a, in a frame, I, they, I can appear. If I'm sitting in the in this frame, I'm basically seeing everything as static, right? So this is a very special case, right? So that's the resonance case. Everything basically, uh, basically in this case, actually the magnetic effect of this strong magnetic field in this direction cancels out it. So if you do the that, and the system will basically start precessing about this extra magnetic field which is rotating, 
uh, it will basically precess around this small magnetic field. So what is, and how does it precess around this? This is a rotation about like this, right? So if you stop at the right moment, then you, when, when it is here, then you have stripped the spin and you take it out and you start precessing around the strong magnetic field. This is, so, and what was the rotating wave approximation is that if I am not on resonance, then I don't have this special case of static. So I could either be very, I could have this omega plus omega zero and omega minus omega zero. When I am close, omega minus omega zero, slow motion, right? It's a small difference in frequency. Omega plus omega zero is much faster. So that faster one basically averages out the small, smaller one is what we are interested in. Anything else? If not, basically let's head for, and we meet at 11.30. <laughs>